Hello, I'm Doug, stand-up physicist on the internet. I clearly don't have an academic position because this is how large my uh, blackboard is. <laughs> We're working out of my basement. Um, so I'm kind of a uh, continuing ed in theoretical physics uh, poster boy. I do my own research and some of that actually has to do uh, with quantum logic as this talk is called The Logic of Coherent Quantum Systems and it's really a reply to Leonard Susskind's really wonderful first lecture on quantum mechanics because what he does in that video is very clearly explain why quantum logic is different from classic logic. And if you're a continuing ed student like myself in theoretical physics, I recommend you watch the video several times. <laughs> I've done that myself and it really helps uh, clarify and solidify uh, the, the way to think about how quantum mechanical logic really is different from classical logic. So I highly recommend that. Now a guy like that is just not going to be wrong in the sense that he's carrying on a long tradition that a lot of other people have thought about very carefully. But there may be differences in emphasis and that's actually what I'm going to try to do in this first half of this talk is say that we really should be spending more time thinking about something different uh, than what he emphasized. But that's just emphasis. And then I'll get into some, some actual math stuff uh, because physics in the end uh, really just comes down to math and you have to get that right. I wanted to say something about Albert Einstein and quantum logic because people often trivialize his perspective. He got quantum logic. <laughs> he was there when uh, Bohr came up with the, the hydrogen atom model, which is, was impressive then. It's impressive today to calculate all those Balmer lines, you know, with a little bit of algebra. Uh, he got the math, all right? But what bothered him was why quantum logic was necessary, why it was different fundamentally from classical logic. And he tried a bunch of things, all of which failed. Now, I'm going to bring something up at the end which might actually succeed there, but I think his goal was right. Quantum logic is different from classic logic, as Susskind goes over, but we want to know why we need that kind of di distinction between the two kinds of ways of, of looking at the physical world. So I'm going to now discuss two th details that I know Susskind is very familiar with. They're going to shift the emphasis uh, from, what, from what he did. And so let's just go ahead and do that. We've only got three players in this logical game. We've got the source, we've got the slit, and we've got the screen where the photons get detected. So you just have the source and it throws out um, some particles and it goes at this screen and to make things simple I, I actually only have one and we get that Gaussian distribution. And I gotta say that Susskin is a hundred percent right if this gun is a classical source. He's also a hundred percent right if this gun is a quantum source for an incoherent quantum system. But he is wrong. Well, I shouldn't say wrong. He didn't go into the detail of if this is a co coherent quantum system. And the detail is that if you make that slit small enough, you get quantum diffraction. Now, what does that look like? Well, it looks an awful lot like this, except that you get these little kind of uh, bumpy things And it looks kind of like that. Well, it's probably not that dramatic, but you know, you get the point. If you look at the edges here, they have that kind of interference sort of thing. Now, why is that so important? 
Well, what it says is that the number of slits doesn't matter. If you look at one slit, and you look at it carefully near the edges, and your system is a coherent quantum system, then you will be able to tell that it is a coherent quantum system. If it is in an incoherent quantum system, it will look like that Gaussian sort of thing. So the, the number of slits doesn't matter at all. And yet <laughs> there's such a huge investment in playing games with the slits. I mean, the experimentalists have done so many sophisticated things with the slits and, and closing the slits and not using the slits and, and going backwards and all kinds of super fancy stuff, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because if there's only one slit, I can tell whether it's a quantum system, a coherent quantum system. So what is a coherent system versus an incoherent system? Well, I've got myself an incoherent system right here. Um, and as a matter of fact, the one time I wrote Scientific American angry uh, at what they uh, had written was these guys were talking about sophisticated quantum eraser experiments, and they had Bohr and Einstein with flashlights, you know, try, trying to, you know, argue about the interference pattern. Huh, you get no interference pattern with one of these. Now, this, on the other hand, this is a laser. Oh, I wonder how many people I'm blinding. <laughs> All right, now you do that sort of thing in here, and you're going to get with one slit, and you will get a little bit of the, these, these fringes on there, this quantum diffraction. If you make this two slits, you'll get quantum interference. So it's really all about the difference. So, so now we've got the slits where it doesn't matter. It, 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 to, to the extent it just changes which phenomenon shows you the fringy stuff, okay? So the number of slits doesn't matter. What does matter is the word coherent. And um, the reason it matters is because if, if you look at incoherent, you don't see, see that kind of interference. You don't see diffraction. So we're going to take a little field trip to look at a piece of artwork I did that's directly related to this issue of a coherent source versus an incoherent source of light. Um, oh, that is the Super Bowl as it's happening. And, um, oh, that's my lovely wife and our six-week-old daughter. I mean, talk about new. She's more interested in uh, really having a meal than watching uh, the game here. We're in the, uh, the end of the second quarter, I believe. And um, i got to trudge up the stairs here. bump a dum bump a dum Go through the dog gate. And this piece of artwork is actually related to physics. It's called the speed of light uh, according to Rene Magritte, but we're not going to actually discuss that sort of thing. I've got to clear another dog gate. This is Gray Albert, well, kind of indicating Einstein's connections, many connections to standard physics. That's turquoise Einstein, because some of his stuff is harder to connect with the rest of physics. Uh, and this is the piece that matters as far as this uh, topic is concerned. It's called Groups of Coherent Photons Behave Like Waves and Particles. So the column in the middle is incoherent light. If you sign that at two slits, you will never see interference. If you sign, shine that at one slit, you will never see quantum diffraction. Now, the columns on the left and the right, that is uh, an example of coherent light in um, coherent time or space, doesn't matter which one. And as you notice, there are places where there are zero photons. That would be the white spots. And in quantum interference and quantum diffraction, we essentially get to see that aspect of this source. Our source is so well organized that eventually we will spot these places that have no photons. And I think that's really all there is 
to it, um, it's if you focus on the source and what co a coherent source means, it means that it's really highly organized like this. Susskind spent 10 seconds on the source and then another 40 seconds discussing the sizes of the source because, you know, guys talk about size. Uh, and he didn't really go into it any more than that. And I think the reason is because experimentalists do all their focus on fancy slit experiments, uh, fancy ways of faking things out. And they really have been quite clever uh, with that kind of work. And so it actually is logical that he kind of emphasized that. But I really think you need to shift back to thinking about the coherence quantum source in order to actually come to peace with what's going on. But that's really just a sh change in emphasis because <laughs> Susskind to totally understands that you need a coherent source. And if you want to come up with something new, well, you really had to get a little math wonky, which is what we're going to do right now. I think the difference between classical logic and quantum logic is a direct result of a collision of the two largest math ideas in all of physics. The first is calculus. The calculus is the study of change. And the first person to do calculus with physics was Newton, and he did a lot of calculus and a lot of physics. And it's one of the true ironies that I am writing this in the notation of Leibniz, who he totally couldn't stand, you know, and he really hated the man. Uh, but it's Leibniz notation that I'm using here to keep with the traditions of Western science. So this should be familiar to uh, continuing ed students in theoretical physics. We're talking about the change in a function with respect to the variable x, and that is defined as a limit process where this delta element of x goes to zero. And we're looking at the difference between the function at x plus dx and f at x, and then divide that by the differential dx. That works for real numbers, and it works exactly in the same way for uh, complex numbers, which is great because that's what Susskind uh, works with. It's not what I work with. <laughs> and that's where I get into a little trouble uh, with the standard community. But that's because I'm thinking about the second huge bit of math tidal wave to show up in physics, and that would be space-time. And Albert Einstein was able to show in two really quite different ways that we need to think about time and space together. Special relativity is the physics of going fast, and it shows how time <clears throat> and space formally mix with each other. And then general relativity, as the name kind of implies, is a way in which time and space really kind of play together at a much deeper level than special relativity. Well, I want to have a derivative over space-time. And if I do that, I'm going to come into some trouble. First of all, most people don't know what comes next, okay, in real number, complex number, and it's called a quaternion. I own quaternions.com. I should know. <laughs> But if you say, now, what's a quaternion derivative? Let me just use this one right out of the box. I mean, I've seen this at a conference, a fellow from Oxford University. And it's awful. Ooh. Because this little differential guy, if you write it uh, here, you end up with a different result than if you write it over there. And so they talk about left-hand derivatives. And they talk about right-hand derivatives, and they both are no good. Because the world isn't like that. So, that actually made me mad. Can you imagine being mad at an Oxford math professor? <laughs> it's happened to me. And so I spent the whole conference trying to come up with something better, and since I'm a creative, logical person, I did come up with an answer. And that's what we're going to discuss. 
Because if we describe this problem as being four-dimensional, we're never going to get anywhere. I mean, I know what three dimensions look like. Uh, it looks like this room. But four dimensions makes no sense. What does make sense is space-time. Because space-time, I've got those three dimensions, and I've got my watch. And my watch is ticking as I'm looking at this. I mean, these guys, they work together. And so all I'm doing is basically making analytical kind of animations. I'm thinking analytical animations, kind of an extension of analytical geometry, only it's more fun to watch. Analytical geometry just sits on a paper for hundreds of years, and analytical animations, well, that, that would change as you watched it. That'd be kind of cool. But we need to have this. If we don't have a really good definition of a derivative, there's no reason to bother with quaternions. It is so core to what physics is, the study of change in space-time. Not four dimensions, in space and time. That's what it is. So, the problem is the pointy thing. It's the pointy thing that if written on the left or written on the right, it causes a problem. And the pointy thing is the space part. Time isn't pointy. Yes, it, there's a positive time and a ne negative time, but it's not, it doesn't have that pointy thingy going on. So my, pro my idea was, let's let the problem child die. Now, we will symbolize this by saying, put a little arrow over that, and that says that's literally the three part. And then we'll put in another limit process here. And we'll say dt goes to zero. So we'll do one right after the other. All right? So, how can we think about this? Well, have you ever seen a movie? <laughs> Because in a movie, if you think of a picture frame, let's just think of a picture frame here. And you've got uh, these three things. They're all stopped. And then you get another picture frame. And this is there. This one's dropped all the way into the corner. And this one's uh, moved a little bit up. We'll just do three picture frames, okay? just to keep things. This guy stays the same spot, this guy moves over here, and this guy reaches all the way to the top. Okay? So here we have a DT. And here we have a DT. But in each of these frames things have frozen, which is really nice. Alright. Now I think that is classical physics. Um, classical mechanics. We'll call it classical mechanics. All right? Because it's ordered in time. A happens, B happens, C happens. Very, very straightforward. Okay? Now you say, but what if somebody goes and flips the, the, those limit processes? Won't that cause you the problem with the pointy thing? Yes, it will. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the way it goes, okay? So now we're thinking about when you ha take the limit process and it's the D pointy thing goes to zero and then but first time goes to zero and then the rest of this by the way is exactly the same, alright? So all I did flip flip the order of that. Now what can I say? Well I got some problems with what I can say, all right? The reason is, I've got the problem of now it matters whether this is on the left or the right. Can I say anything? The answer is yes. What I can talk to you about is the average amount of change in space-time of that function. I can't say, oh, this was the last thing. I can just say, on average, that's what happened. So if we get back to to, to this, well, th this, is, this is no longer happening. What is happening? Well, I'm essentially getting these three pictures. And let's just say, uh, for the sake of argument, that 
uh, in this particular system, we've got 10 of these, to one of these, and one of these. All right? And uh, actually make the math easier. Let's make, I got eight of these. All right? And I, what I could do with these three films, these three frames, is I could superimpose them. I could say, okay, I'm going to use Photoshop, and I'm going to just take all of, I'm going to take one of these, eight of these, one of these, and make my average picture, my average picture show. And in that case, I'd get a dot there, and I get a lot of dots in the corner. Wherever this, actually, everybody is here. Um, a lot of dots there, the little dot, and a little dot over here, if I recall. And uh, so a lot of dot there, a little dot there, and the other dot is kind of like there. All right? That's my average picture, and I'm calling it my superposition. All right, so what happens if I go and make a measurement when this kind of thing is going on? Well, 80% of the time, I'm going to see what this frame. I'm just going to get that 8% of the time. And every once in a while, I get this one, and once in a while, I get that one. And you can be very actually precise about how often you get these kinds of things. But I think that's what the story of quantum mechanics is. So this down here is quantum mechanics. All right. Now, Susskind's um, talk was, was great in clarifying that quantum logic is different from classical uh, logic. But he was very careful in not saying why they were different. To me, the entire difference comes down to this definition of derivative, which is actually, you can say this, when this is lower than the speed of light. Okay, I should throw in a C here. Um, whereas if, if, the system, if the system is basically space-like separated, if it's made of a bunch of things that never like get together, well, all you can kind of do is describe on average what they do and then this becomes the world of quantum mechanics. And it will have all the properties that, uh, that Dr. Uh, Susskind uh, went over. Uh, but this is now a reason why. And believe me, I'm completely at peace with his description of quantum logic. It's the omission of why that I try to address here. Thank you very much. And the rock star.